Ladies and gentlemen, if we can take your seats, please, I'd like to get the meeting started. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to the uh, Litchfield Waterline Extension Meeting. My name is Frank Byron. I'm a selectman with the town of Litchfield. I'm here because John Reagan, the town moderator, is tied up, uh, starting to organize for the elections coming up November 8th. So you, uh, unfortunately, are stuck with me. <clears throat> First off, what I'd like to do is if we could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First off, to begin the meeting, I'd like to make some introductions to who uh, the people are. As I said before, my name is Frank Byron. I'm one of your town selectmen. Up here with me are the following people, if you could raise your hand to identify yourselves. Larry Goodhue, Chief Executive Officer of Penichuk Waterworks. We have Clark Frazee, Assistant Commissioner of the Department of uh, Environmental Services. We have Mr. Troy Brown, Town Administrator for Litchfield. And we also have with us uh, David Van Slyke, of Pretty Flaherty, who is a special town council representing the town of Litchfield. A couple uh, organizational things before we uh, cover the agenda. First off, we have to leave this facility by no later than 9.30 p.m. tonight. That's because of the uh, coverage by the um, custodial staff for the school. So what we've done is we have set a hard stop at 8 o'clock tonight. And the whole purpose of this is to present you with the information you need to sign up in order to participate in the water line extension. That is the ultimate purpose of this meeting, is to get you uh, organized such that uh, Penachuk will know how many people they are going to be having signed into the water system. And you will also be able to get an understanding as to what the schedules are, cost, that type of thing, if there's any. First off, what uh, tonight's agenda is going to include is going to be a presentation by myself concerning where the town stands in terms of uh, the uh, demands to St. Gobain, as well as the work we've done with both Panachuk as well as uh, Department of uh, Environmental Services. Town Council for Litchfield is going to present some information concerning what the town can and cannot do in terms of seeking restitution. Following that, we're going to have uh, Mr. Goodhue present information concerning uh, signing up for Penachuk Water, uh, answering some questions, that type of thing. And then we'll, the last speaker is going to be uh, Clark Frazee, who's going to talk about point of use wells uh, treatment and um, where we're going to stand going there. After that, those of you who don't have any questions and who would like to uh, leave the meeting and go sign up and get your paperwork done, You'll be more than willing to do that. Uh, we will take questions up until 8 o'clock tonight, and at that point we have a hard stop, and uh, we will stay around so that if you do have questions that weren't answered, we'd be willing to uh, go through those with you. So without anything further, from the town's perspective, the water line extension is a key project 
that we need to have completed in order to get you people water. The town back in May of 2016 was approached by Penichuk Corporation with a request for information and our support in terms of trying to provide people water through this emergency. They were working on behalf of St. Gobain in order to try and do that. The Board of Selectmen heard the questions of Penichuk and at that point in time we called an emergency selectmen's meeting and met with key town officials, consultants, and tried to identify the concerns and issues that needed to be addressed before we could allow them to open up our streets to try and uh, install this water system. All through this, the town's main concerns were twofold. First off, we wanted to ensure that those who were affected by the PFOA contamination were able to receive potable water. And secondarily, we wanted to ensure that the Litchfield taxpayers were not impacted by this event which we as a town did not cause. Based upon that meeting, as well as several others that occurred shortly afterwards, the town of Litchfield presented Penichuk with information as to what our requirements were. Penichuk has incorporated those requirements into the bid requirements that they've sent out now to contractors to act upon. First off, to try and protect the taxpayers, one of the things that the town has requested and uh, required of Penichuk and the contractors is that our roads are going to have to remain open at all times. We also re require that once installation is complete, the roads are going to be repaved after an appropriate settling period to allow for settling of dirt that may need uh, further compaction. We, we required that water lines that are going to feed lots that decide not to take water are going to have to have the lines or tees uh, uh, let off to the side of the road so that we do not have to dig up the road again if somebody later down the road decides that they want to install water. The town will be reimbursed for police details. We also have hired uh, Mr. Luke Karen, who's very familiar with the town and has done a lot of engineering work on behalf of mostly the planning board to help supervise the installation of this to make sure that nothing's being installed that would not be to town standards. That includes both the water lines as well as the roads. We've required that steel piping be used for the installation. It was our feeling that this would have the best longevity and uh, would uh, provide the best quality of water. We also required, and discussions through our uh, uh, fire chief that while these water lines are being installed we will install fire protection in the form of hydrants as required by the town zoning ordinances. Town permits are required to be, to be uh, obtained when necessary and in fact there's already people who are working with our town officials to try and get those permits. And the town will also hold a bond so that if anything in this project goes wrong the town can call that bond, get that fixed according to what our engineering staff would say, and make sure that we do not have a problem that's been created. It's the belief on the part of the Board of Selectmen that these requirements will protect the town against expenses and costs that are going to be incurred during this uh, process. So let me go on for a moment and talk a little bit about our relationship with uh, St. Gobain. New Hampshire DES and St. Gobain um, have been negotiating an agreement and we are thankful through New Hampshire DES that they have kept the town informed in, in the general status of these discussions. St. Gobain has contracted with Penichuk Waterworks to uh, install or connect approximately 360 homes to the expanded water system in Litchfield. I want to state and make sure you understand that the contract between St. Gobain and Penichuk is not a settlement contract uh, between the town of Litchfield and St. Gobain. There is still discussions that are going on, which I'll discuss, which go over in a moment, as to what the demands of the town of Litchfield are uh, that have been sent to St. Gobain. We as a town, the Board of Selectmen, have communicated the following demands to St. Gobain. 
Number one, payment of past and future costs incurred for the work performed by the town related to the PFOA incident. For example, we already have police details that have been run. We already have uh, people who have been helping distribute water, that type of thing. And we're looking to have those bills paid. Payment of impacted citizens as well as businesses water bills for a period of 20 years. Pay payment of additional costs of hydrant installation in perpetuity. Payment of costs associated with water treatment for any town recreational facility. In other words, there may be an, is an issue where, uh, and we'll hear this from DES tonight, whether we can or cannot use wells for doing uh, irrigation at town recreational facilities. And payment for groundwater impact study to try and address the impact of additional groundwater removal from existing wells. Because we're gonna be connecting 360 new homes to the existing system, the wells that are currently providing water to those, that system, we feel could be stressed. And what we wanted to have is a study done to try and understand what the stress on those, new, on those existing wells would be. And we also requested that we get reimbursed for the cost of an independent study of townwide property values that could be impacted due to this PFOA contamination. So what's the status of those requests? About mid-June, we met with New Hampshire DES to uh, seek involvement in the decision-making process that they were involved in with St. Gobain. In approximately late June and early July, the town had requested that we have a meeting with St. Gobain to discuss the demands. So far, to date, there has been one meeting between St. Gobain and the town of Litchfield that occurred approximately in early September. St. Gobain has agreed to continue discussions and to consider the town demands and also verbally indicated that they reimburse certain expenditures of the town that we have made to date such as police detail, that type of thing. The agreement on the extension of the water system is subsequently reached between New Hampshire DES and St. Gobain. The town of Litchfield has not been a signatory to that. The, BO, the, the Board of Selectmen, we understand that there is an agreement between Penichuk and St. Gobain subsequently that has been entered into for the installation of the water system. We, as your board, continue to seek res resolution of our demands to St. Cobain. I want to assure you that the demands I presented to you moments ago have not been backed off from. The primary issue right now, as we see it as a board, is to make sure that you people have water that you can use and live with. Our next step going forward is to formalize these demands through our town council into a letter that will be given to St. Gomain and a request again to meet directly with the town. We'll see, where that, we'll see where that goes and we will keep you informed of that. All of this information exists on the town's website and anybody who wishes to see those letters can go to our town website and uh, pull them down. Now what I'd like to do is turn this over to town council, Mr. David Van Slyke, and he will talk a little bit about the ability of the town in terms of what uh, we can do in negotiating with St. Gobain. David? Thanks, Frank. Uh, again, my name is David Van Slyke. I'm an attorney and environmental lawyer with the law firm of Pretty Clarity. Um, in terms of the town's authority, the town does have the ability to do certain things and not do other things with regard to this particular situation. Uh, as the slide uh, indicates, the town is able to pursue claims and causes of action on behalf of the town relative to the impacts to the municipality as an entity, such as um, out-of-pocket costs, whatever those might be that the town has incurred in dealing this, with this PFOA issue. Um, also. They can, the town, as a town, can pursue townwide property valuations impacting the tax base and property damage claims related to town-owned properties. There are certain things, however, that the town itself cannot, cannot do. It cannot pursue on behalf of its individual citizens as individuals 
those residences that have any health related claims um, or with regard to individual property damage claims. Those are something that would have to be dealt with on an individual basis, on a going, on a going forward basis between you and your own lawyer dealing with whatever claims you felt were necessary to pursue to uh, deal with your health claims to the extent you have any or individual property damage claims. Thank you, David. So that ends the town's presentation. We will have time for question and answer after this. Next up, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Larry Goodhue, Chief Executive Officer Panacek, to discuss about the pipeline extension. Thank you. Good evening. Um, we're going to go through a, a presentation here relative to the project that is uh, already begun. Uh, I'm told that actually some saw cutting was starting on some of the streets uh, today by my chief engineer, John Bovair, who's uh, loading up my presentation for me. <laughs> Top right there, John. We're good at water. And John is really good at designing water systems, so. We've got 15 backseat drivers here, so um, thank you. Um, I'm going to go through a lot of information here. You may have some questions, as Frank indicated a moment ago. We'll uh, be, uh, you know, more than happy to answer any and all questions once Mr. Frizey's completed his presentation as well, because I think that some of the questions that you may have actually may be answered by him after I've completed my part of the presentation. First, an overview of the project. Um, we were uh, here a couple months ago uh, relative to uh, designing a, a, a an expansion of the water system as contracted by St. Cobain. On October 14th, we did enter into a contract with them where they have actually approved and have provided the funding for the expansion of the public water system to the affected residents in North Litchfield. It's a two-phase project. Phase one has already begun. Uh, phase two will be completed in the spring and early summer of 2017. And why is there two phases? Uh, in New England, we run out of time to, to actually work installing water mains and service lines because of the winter conditions that, that come later this year. Uh, so to the extent that the ground remains open and we're able to work in the streets and in the, in the properties, we'll be able to do so. There are 10 different contracts that have been entered into with this project. Three different main extension contracts and the water mains are the large pipes that will be underneath the streets that are basically the veins underneath the streets that provide the, the water to the individual service lines. And then there are seven different contracts for the installation of those water services into properties. Why so many contracts? One of the things we wanted to do was to be able to, to bring this project to bear as fast as we could. And by work, having a lot of people working in parallel, we hope to be able to accomplish that. Uh, construction will result in certain streets being impacted throughout the area with temporary pavement being installed initially and a final recode of the roads as sections are brought to full completion. And as Mr. Byron indicated, with a uh, cooling off period per se, where we'll come back uh, and actually do a full pavement from, from, from side to side in the streets after the project is all completed uh, and, and that time has passed. Let's look at phase one. We'll begin the installation of water makes in three simultaneous projects starting at connection points to our existing water system in the town. As many of you know, we already supply water to a portion of Litchfield, and so we have certain points that it's very logical for us to now be extending the system from those points of connection. We're seeking to connect up to 173 properties in phase one. Keywords are up to. It really comes down to how much time do we have before we have to cease operations because of weather. Um, any of the phase one properties that cannot uh, be connected by year end will be provided with point of use systems, which Mr. Frizey will talk about in his presentation uh, until construction can resume in the spring. If you look at this map here, and we focus in on the yellow lines here, so there's a section here, there's a section here, and there's a section here, that represents phase one. And so the properties that are abutting those, those water mains are the connections that we're seeking to connect in phase one. Okay? And so I'm sure everybody's looking on there to say, where is my lot and where is my house on that map? I apologize for it being so small, but I'm sure there are maps in the hall that you could actually get a better reference on that. Phase two. 
That's when we will complete the installation of water mains in the three simultaneous projects, starting at where we stopped with phase one with the mains and continuing it until we get all of the water mains installed. Uh, construction of the phase uh, two water mains will begin on or about April 1st, weather permitting. If we've got an early open in the spring, we get started sooner. A late open, it takes a little bit longer. Construction is scheduled to be completed by mid-August of 2017, with then the subsequent timing for that compaction to happen to come back for final paving. And public water connections will then be done to replace any installed point of view systems in people's homes. So let's go back to the map. I talked about phase one being the yellow areas. Phase two are the orange lines that you see on this map uh, relative to those connections. The red represents our existing water system. So we would start from here, from here, from here, from here, as far as the expansions in phase one, and then connect off of phase one to phase two as we continue that installation of the water mains and the service lines as we go through and, and pass your property. Now what's interesting is you might see a lot of activity of water mains being put in the street and you say, well, how soon am I getting water? Well, we've got to put enough main in the street to then be putting the connections in and you still may not have water because the water line will not be pressurized, tested, and completely full, full and operational. Okay, so I'll go through that in a minute. Certain key personnel that are working on this job, our chief engineer, John Bovere, our construction manager, Mark Fillion, put in a lot of time, and they're, they're really the ones that are riding herd on this process. Uh, we'll have a field liaison person, Victoria Bullard, who will be out there actually working in the field, addressing and working with the contractors and working with you as residents as we go through this process. We're going to have a team of construction inspectors out there in addition to the town's inspector. inspector. And those uh, inspectors will be either Petichuk employees or contract employees that we brought on specifically for this project. Again, bringing enough manpower to bear to get this project done efficiently and as quickly as we possibly can. There will certainly be construction company subcontractors out there with those, all those contractors working in parallel. And any call, uh, concerns or questions you would have, call our 800 number at the company and our customer service department will be there to answer questions directly and or redirect them to an individual that can assist you with your questions. So we're going to use them as a point of contact. That's your hotline number. Call in. You've got questions. Our customer service people are very, very skilled in either answering questions or knowing who to find to help get those questions answered for you. We will need to gain access to your home and property once again. Uh, we had to do that once before to go in and really scope out what it meant on your property and why are we doing it this time. Well, first off, we're going to be installing a main to stop service line will be installed from the water mains in the streets to a shutoff valve that is installed at your property line. Mr. Byron talked about the fact that one of the requirements the town had was we don't care if a home is occupied or wants water. We don't care if it's a vacant lot. Every single lot within this footprint, we want a service be being brought to that property line. So even if water isn't connected now, it can be at some point in time in the future without opening the road up once again. And that is called the main to stop. So it goes from the water main, and it goes out as a T, as he talked about, comes out to a shutoff valve at your property line. Then what happens is a new service line will be installed from that valve, from the stop, to the end on your property. So it begins at that shutoff valve and comes into your home through your foundation. Once the water mains have all been installed, pressure tested, and fully charged, the connection of your current well will then be terminated in your home and the new water meter will be installed, allowing for the supply of public water to be initiated. So what does that mean when we say current well be, will be terminated in your home? What it means is we're going to cut that well line that is coming into your home, leave a section outside of the, the foundation inside your home and cap it, and then awaiting further disposition based on your election relative to the decommissioning or non-decommissioning of your private well. We're coming in there for the purpose of connecting public water and just leaving that to be dispensed with after the fact. It'll mean either we're going to either cut that line right before your pressure tank or right after your pressure relief tank, depending on how much geography there is in your home. Everybody's home's different, and we need enough space within your home to bring in the water lines we need to be able to put the meter in place and to be able to then reconnect that to the plumbing in your home. We won't do that connection until we've got a charged water main and water coming in that service line so that when we connect it, you're on, okay, and you're ready to go. Uh, a full description of the steps in this overall process, very detailed, will be included in your customer information package at the tables in the hallway 
uh, once you go out here after this presentation is completed. Uh, John, uh, John Volver and his team took the time to actually go through a very, very detailed outline of what your expectations would be in this whole process so you can understand all the steps along the way. We want to readdress the security procedures. When we were here last time, we talked about the fact that safety and security of our employees and our customers of utmost importance to us. So we're going to have a lot of people working in the field, and we want to make sure that you know that the people out there are working for us. So we will not seek to gain access to your home without a prearranged appointment. Okay, there will be crews from Penichuk or our soft contractors within the area, but not directly on your property. If they need to gain access to your home, it'll be through a prearranged appointment. All of our employees will be wearing Penichuk Water logo clothing, similar to what I'm wearing right now. So it's got the name and the logo on it, okay? Maybe they'll have a Penichuk hat as well, or a Penichuk jacket, because the weather's starting to turn cold. Um, that all of our employees will have a Penichuk badge with the following information on it. Their name, their picture, their badge number, and the company 800 number, okay? So you can verify that that person is working for us. If you'd like to call the company to confirm the identity of the individual, they will give you a card with an 800 number on it and their name, and so you can call our customer service department to confirm their identity. And they, they have a, a special way that they can confirm the identity of that person so you can now be assured that, yes, this person is truly a Penn Chuck representative that's there trying to gain access to your home. Most of our employees will be driving Penn Chuck logoed vehicles. However, some individuals may be driving vehicles without logos. We will keep the police department and our customer service department aware of what those vehicles are, including make, model, and registration number, so they can be confirmed as well. What does it mean to be a customer of a public water system? So we connect public water. What does it mean? Okay. So number one, you will have access to water at your property, which is subject to compliance with all the state and federal standards under the Safe Drinking Water Act. It's monitored and tested and treated in compliance with these standards and testing requirements, including treatment for disinfection using chlorine in our system. It's supplied to you by a system with 24-7, 365 access, including backup power systems in the event of a power failure in your area. All of our water systems are, are, are that way. Uh, we undertook a multi-year process over the past several years to make sure the backup power was put on all of our water systems, so even in a power outage, our people had water. For more information on the water quality results for the water supply for the Litchfield system, I put up here uh, the specific link on our website. But if you don't see this tail here, if you go onto our website, under the title of Water Utilities, the first item under there is called Consumer Confidence Reports. And if you go and click on that and look for the one for the Litchfield Core water system, that is where the customer confidence report is for that system. So you can see the testing results that we have to report on an annual basis for the water that's going to be coming into your home. So what's next? So after the DES gives an update on their role in this process, including the following, discussion of private well decommissioning or continued use options, and point of use treatment systems as far as eligibility and implementation. In the hallway, we have a series of tables set up. Our folks are setting them up as we're meeting in here, alphabetically by last name of the legal property owner. Our people are there ready to assist you to have you complete and sign a service application agreement in order to have access to public water through our Penichuk East Utility subsidiary. Even though many of you know us as Penichuk Water, we're actually a consolidated group of six corporations. And the water system in Litchfield is actually run under our Penichuk East Utility subsidiary. So you'll see the documentation says that name. You'll also make and sign your well decommissioning election as Mr. Frizy will go through in a few moments. And then you're also going to need to complete, sign, and notarize your pressure reducing file form if that's applicable to your property. About, uh, what is it, 80 properties out of the 360 are going to require a pressure reducing valve be installed because the pressure in that part of the system is, is so high that if we didn't put a pressure reducing valve on it, it would blow out the appliances in your home, which you wouldn't really want to have happen. Uh, but that requires us to have a notarized form that is actually filed with the Registry of Deeds. So we've got notaries out there as well who are ready to notarize these forms. If for some reason you're not going to make your election tonight on the well decommissioning, we have uh, 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 the availability for you to be able to take that with you, sign it, and mail it back to you. We've got prepaid postage envelopes for that purpose. Uh, you'll also get a copy of the template documents as well as our new customer introduction materials. Uh, so you're going to get some documents. So you're going to be 
signing an application for service installation. It's got information, and then if it may apply, this is the pressure reducing valve form. So, and then we've got a customer information package where we've got information about the company, about what average water usage looks like in a home, what our current tariff rate structure is, and then what does it mean to be on a community well system, which is what uh, this system is. This system is supplied by two different sources of supply. We've got two wells now at this in, in, uh, in Litchfield that uh, provide uh, supply to the system, as well as we have an interconnection to our water treatment plant in Nashua coming over across the Taylor Falls Bridge that supplies water into the system as well. So we've got two sources of supply that come into the system. What's next? Any questions? Um, we'll answer those after Mr. Fry as he goes through his part of the presentation. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Clark Frizey. I've been here a couple of times. Um, we've been to a lot of these meetings. I don't know if they're enjoying this. Uh, it is for once, though, we've got some real progress, and it is a big deal to, at this pace, be able to offer getting a significant number of homes connected to public water. So uh, I'm glad you could come, and we'll try and answer a couple of key questions and get everybody moving along. Uh, first thing I'd like to discuss with you is a choice you do need to make and that is what are you going to do with your well. Once you are connected to Penichuk Public Water, your well system will be disconnected from your home systems. And that's important. We cannot have contaminated water back flowing into the Penichuk system and getting spread to other people. So it's very important that that decision gets made. St. Cobain, with administrative assistance from Penichuk, is offering three options. All of these are at no cost to you. First is decommissioning your well. Separate is a second connection of the well to an outdoor spigot or irrigation system. And the third is to refuse public water, which was already covered by Larry. Um, all of these are offered, again, at no expense to you. Decommissioning involves disconnecting the electric and the plumbing connections, pulling the pump, and filling the well in with a safe material, grout, for lack of a better phrase. We recommend that all of you take that option. Uh, the reasons for this are fairly simple. One is PFOA and PFOS are not good for you. I think we've been through this enough times. You sort of got the point. But the fact is the EPA has set a health advisory. They've done that by going through the best peer-reviewed science that's out there. And the fact is continued contact with PFOA and PFOS can lead to adverse health outcomes. Separating yourself from that water reduces your risks. So that's the biggest one. Second one is, if you do have that well, you tested, let's say you tested at 60. Doesn't mean you're going to stay at 60. For all we know, and when you look at the variation that we've seen in the contamination in town, you may be 70, 80, 90 within a week, two weeks. We don't know. There's no way for us to forecast. And as the people around you stop using their wells, we really don't know what's going to happen next to your particular well. And so you've got to think of not just what is your health risk today, but what is your health risk going to be tomorrow. If that level goes up enough and your well is declared as a public health risk, you actually have the risk that the public health officer for the town in conjunction with us may come in and tell you that you have to shut off that well and decommission it. At that point, it'll be at your expense, not at St. Cobain's. Last is, if you do go to sell your house, Make sure I get the rule here so I get it right. Underneath New Hampshire state law, RSA 331-A colon 25-B, I looked it up, uh, your realtor is actually required, if you're selling a property with a contaminated well in use on the property, your realtor has to share that information with a prospective buyer. For all of these reasons, we recommend decommission your well. Now, alternatively, if you don't want it decommissioned, you can choose to have your well in service for non-consumptive purposes. So there's a nice phrase, non-consumptive. Spray it on your lawn, spray it on your car. But if you, your neighbor, your kids, your pet are going to put whatever the object is into your mouth, don't put the water on it. Try and make that really simple. Now, 
It's not a recommendation. We understand a number of people may want to go to that. So how does this work? You've got the form here. Larry talked about it. Here's the exact one you're going to get. You need to go check the blocks. There's language underneath there. We will have a DES employee at the table. So if you've got questions about it, we'll be glad to answer them for you. The third option is to refuse public water. Again, we do not recommend that. This is the chance to get connected to highly regulated, very well controlled water. Penichuk does a very nice service. They've absorbed a lot of water systems around the state for us, and they've done a very nice job. All right, now the next subject is the extent of the current water system extension project. As was mentioned, not all of Litchfield is covered by this phase or the second phase of this project. If you've been with us since the beginning of this in March when we got together here, well, actually the middle school, um, you've seen a change in this investigation. We started, we had a one mile radius investigation area, which we thought was maybe a little conservative. Um, that didn't last too long. Then it was a mile and a half. Then we found places outside the mile and a half. I can tell you, if you look at this map, at the very bottom is my house, 2.4 miles from the plant, tested my well. Um, we don't know where the end of this is going to be. We had to go forward, though, and get this project going. And Penichuk has been a fantastic partner in this. But when we first knew about this in March and April, we had to delineate an area. We delineated the area that we knew the contamination was high, either 70 or your neighbors were at that range. And those are the areas that are shown in red and black. In our color coding, red means you're going to get done this year, weather permitting. Black means you're going to get done next year. You will see there are other colors on there. Gray means you're already connected to Penichuk. So sort of a moot point, and I'm surprised you're here, to be honest. Green means that it is not currently developed. There is no home there. We have checked it through multiple sources, but there's some chance we've missed because we're doing it through the tax rolls, and if you've somehow managed to avoid the tax rolls, congratulations. <laughs> the other colors, though, you are not in the current phases. So what we've got is we've got three boards that are blow-ups of this out there. We've got DES employees next to them. They've got a listing of every single address. So if you're not certain, go out and find them. We are also going to get point-of-use treatment systems for all houses in the area, all these colored areas, that are above 70. St. Cobain has agreed to do that, even though everybody in the area is eligible for bottled water. Bottled water is the minimum requirements under the state. We pushed that we didn't feel that was adequate during the winter time, and they have agreed everybody 70 and older, 70 and over, will have a point of use treatment system. Uh, those will be installed by Culligan. We'll set up a separate meeting to go through that process. You got enough on your plate tonight. We'll come back for that one with Culligan to show you an exact unit and how they're going to do it and everything else. Everybody else, we will go through another round of testing to ensure that you are still below 70 and make sure that you can be safe in continuing just on the bottled water until we can get you onto the public water extension. If you've got any questions, concerns, anything about the bottled water delivery system, Andy Fulton, Andy, in the back row there in the green shirt, beard, nice guy. Most of you have met him delivering water. He will be outside also, so if you have any questions, he'll be glad to answer them for you also. Beyond that, as was mentioned, Penichuk, while we've been in here, has been setting up tables, thereby the last name of the owner of the property. They have Penichuk employees and DES employees at every one of them to answer your questions and to try and to help you in making your decisions. The real goal here is to get you out there so you can ask your individualized questions and get personal answers. If there are any overarching questions associated with the overall program, we can answer those now, but really the goal is to get everybody out so you can get your personal questions answered. Sir. I'm just curious, you, you uh, came around and I can hear you. I'll, I'll restate your question. Yeah, I, I actually could hear him. So, well, I would restate the question. The question was, a team went around and did the designs, and there is a pre-planned design for each individual home. Can you see that in advance? 
Absolutely. Call our customer service department. They'll direct you to somebody to be able to access that. Okay. One other thing that I meant to mention when I was talking is the forms we're using are the forms that are dictated that we must use for all of our service connections. So the application is a standard one that is PUC approved. It indicates that there may be some responsibilities for you as a homeowner to pay for certain things. That is not the case. This entire project is being funded by St. Gobain. Excuse me, hang on one second. We're just trying to get coordinated here. So if people have questions that they wish to ask, if you could please move down to the microphone so we can hear you, that would be great. Ma'am, go ahead if you... Uh, my well is under... Can you step closer to the microphone? My well is under 70, and I was told that there may be a re testing of the wells yes ma'am the the question was if your well was under 70 before will it be a retesting and yes what St. Cobain has agreed is everybody who's already tested above 70 gets a point of use in addition to bottled water everybody who is below 70 we're going to go back through and do some testing we're obviously going to focus on the people who are close to 70 first close to 60 second one side of my, ho of my house, one side of my land is 140, and the other side is 120. I'm at 65. Doesn't make sense. I yes, mean, you know that it's over that amount. Yes, ma'am. And what we have agreement right now is 70 and above. They're putting the point of use in. We are working to get houses. But not for me. I won't get the point of use. Not immediately. You are on bottled water, and yeah. bottled water will continue. We are working with them to get them to put a little window around the 70 so that you don't have to worry. But today, I don't have that agreement. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Sir, on the microphone, you oh, had yes. a question? Um, for the town, how is Penichuk selected when their water is more than surrounding water companies that have lines that we can easily tie into that extra 100 feet that so, might not be so as close? So what ends up happening wise. is the Public Utilities Commission creates what's called a franchise area. Penichuk holds the franchise to this area, so it would be illegal for any other company to come in. Is there, That's done at the state level. We don't, selectmen don't control that. Is there any way to help reduce the cost where other companies can do it for lower? All of our rates are pursuant to uh, the regulatory process and are based on tariffs that are established, based yeah. on just basically the cover, coverage of our costs. It's the cost of our investment in the infrastructure and the cost of operating the system. Uh, that's that's what it's made up of, and and so we promulgate a rate case on a regular basis, and it's for the coverage of those costs. Okay. When yep. I called Penichuk Customer Service and Liberty Utilities, they both said they're in talks with the city while we're digging up the roads because it costs a lot of money, a lot of time to install gas lines in the same proximity where they're digging up, in which to help provide additional services here in the town. Mm -hmm. that, that has not been discussed as of yet. I keep calling the town, I keep telling, well, we're looking at it. So now they're digging the road up, and we don't want to do it twice. Is this going to happen? Because it would be a real nice benefit for the town. We've had discussions with Liberty Utilities. Liberty Utilities was presented that this project would be happening, and now would be a time to try and do that. We have not heard back from Liberty Utilities. They have continued to work with the high school potentially to get uh, gas put in here. But we're focused on water right now, and I want to make sure we try and maintain that. Your point's well taken, though. So Is it being looked at at all still? Yeah, it's being looked at. I'll call them tomorrow and have them call you. Who would I have them call you guys? Have them talk to the town administrator. Okay. Ma'am? Um, the first question I have is by signing all of the papers tonight, is that going to limit any of our liability or responsibilities if we go forward with um, whatever we have to go forward with with St. Gobain and our, um, you know, whatever our damages are, whatever. But also I wanted to know, once we're connected to the water, are we going to be responsible for paying that water immediately and then get reimbursed if we... You know, so we're going to have to pay water bills immediately once we're connected to the water. So the first question concerning your legal liabilities, I would suggest you take that up with your own counsel. But you're asking us to sign these papers tonight, so I have to sign papers tonight and then find okay. legal counsel. I can't. In the I'm not an attorney, and for me to give you legal advice would not be appropriate. Okay, and I don't know anybody else. But but I, 
but, but, I, but I will tell you that without signing the agreement, we cannot provide public water to you. So okay. that, that's a, there's a decision point there, ma'am. And again, as a regulated utility, we have to do that. As far as the payment of the bills, once we connect water, there is an obligation to pay those monthly bills. What is done after the fact, as far as you know, how that might get reimbursed, um, is something that would have to be addressed with DES and St. Cobain. So. And your second question, remind me again, was? Well, he, he just answered the second question. Okay. Sir? <clears throat> yeah, I've got two questions also. Um, if, if I decide to retain my uh, non-consumptive well stem and I am found as a public health risk, uh, how is that going to happen? Are those levels predetermined? How we do know what, what, and also at what approximate cost it would cost me to no longer be a public health risk? My second question, David, I don't know if you're the one to answer this one, um, but the demands that the town has, uh, and we haven't quite come to terms with Penn and Chuck over these demands, how much are we digging our heels in? How much are they digging our heels in? If it was a Pats game, is it likely, questionable, doubtful? So I can answer the first one. I cannot answer the second one whatsoever. So the first one is right now we have a state standard. It was just made official law. We have an ambient ground quality standard, which is 70 parts per trillion. If you're withdrawing water that is above 70 parts per trillion and putting it where people could consume it, then you are potentially a health risk. It would depend on how you have it hooked up, what you're doing with it, and so forth. Um, that's the standard we know today. If a year from now we find that there are more health risks, and we've brought many times, we don't know exactly what the health risks are, that standard may move, and on that day, we would react to whatever the standard is. Similarly, wait, one more point, just was brought up by the lady over there, you know, She's 65, both of her neighbors are 120. They stop pumping, she keeps pumping. I'm not guaranteeing you stay at 65. You know, we're, we're trying to give you the straight facts the best we can. But, but the other point that you're making is how it's being used. If I'm watering my lawn, washing my car. Right, and, and there are certainly cases where people have a wholly enclosed underground system for irrigation where the chances of somebody being exposed or drinking from it or something else are lower. We certainly look at the entire circumstance before doing something. So the town's primary focus was really to make sure that this process gets started here and that people get either point of use um, filters on their on their systems or get connected up to public to public water. The secondary piece was to make sure that the town, in fact, is not put in a worse position as a town vis-a-vis what, is, what has happened to the town as a whole, um, whether it's you know, the property tax, global property tax base um, being diminished, whether it's you know, the actual out-of-pocket costs that, people, that the town administrator is incurring, et cetera. That's the type of thing that we're moving forward with. Again, the primary focus was get to, to the place we're at here today with, with Penichuk and DES and the folks getting alternative water supply. Sir? Yeah, so what I want to know is, um, you said 80 homes are going to re uh, receive pressure reducing valves. What's the minimum pressure going to most of your homes? And if it's below a certain pressure, are we going to have to incur a cost of adding a booster system around our home? I'm sorry, the second part to your question was? Are the homeowners going to occur, incur? Oh, is a booster? You, booster you will not systems. need a booster, no. Um, you know, we'll be providing more than adequate pressure. Uh, as far as the actual pressure, I believe it's 30 pounds per square inch. Um, I wish I could see one of my engineering folks. They're not here in the well, room. I rely on those folks. Most of your homes require, I think, I believe, at least a minimum of 60 pounds. Yes? Well, again, um, if you check with me afterwards, I'll point you to one of my engineering folks that can answer that specific question, okay? Again, we're, we're answering overarching questions. If you've got a personal question about the pressure at your particular home, the people at the table can look at the design and they can tell overall, you. Overall, because if the pressure's not a certain amount, they're going to need to put pressure I mean, systems in our home. Which sir, what we're saying is if people have overarching questions about the overall thing, that's one thing. If you've got a concern about the pressure at your house, they can tell you exactly for your house 
Okay. We can't. And so that's what we're saying is for the stuff that has to do with your personal house, they've got the answers for you house by house by house. All right. We don't have those answers in here. Sir? This is for uh, Penichuk. Certain parts of the state are having a drought situation. Can Penichuk guarantee as much as you can that you can add another 300, 300 homes and have enough water for the next two, three, four, five years? Yes. Um, as I mentioned, we've got two sources of supply to the system currently. Uh, one is from the wells that are uh, located in, in town here that are jointly owned by, jointly owned by us and actually the town of Hudson. Uh, but we also do to supply water across the Taylor Falls Bridge from our Nashua treatment plant. Uh, so we've been able to provide adequate water. And we're actually also looking at additional uh, resources going forward relative to the supply of water. But uh, we do have adequate supply to supply the additional 360 homes. Uh, part of this overall project is actually to upgrade the Dara Pond pumping station to help with some of those pressure needs relative to this expansion, sir. Does that answer your question? Good. Just a quick question. In your presentation, you said that it was the mains were going to be steel. Duck to lion, actually. Duck to lion, okay. That answers my yeah. question. Yeah. Our Good. steel is completely unreliable for water. It's duck to lion. Okay. There is thank a big difference. You. Sir? Yes, um, thank you for this evening, by the way. My wife has a question, but she's shy, so I will ask that question. I think I know the answer. Let's assume we, do, we decide we do not want town water at this time. And our PFOAs are below the 70 min, but then they increase. Then we even if it doesn't increase, once road work is done on my road, will St. Gobain still supply the water, bottled water, to my house? No, sir. That's Un what I thought. Under the state laws, which we're uh, asked to hold, right. once they have offered you public drinking water, a safe source of drinking water, they have met their legal obligations. Gotcha. Thank you. Ma'am? Hi, this question is for Penichuk. Um, about a month ago, I attempted to hook back into the system. I've been disconnected for 22 years now. Mm -hmm. When the gentleman came to the house, I was told that I have to disconnect my well 100% on my cost before your company will even come in and hook us back up. Why is that? When we supply public water, a private well does need to be disconnected. There has to be a physical separation. But they're telling us that we have to do it. I have, I have a plumber coming in next week to totally disconnect me at my cost. I didn't pollute my water. Why is this at my cost? Is she one of the 79 additional properties? I don't know. Where, where do you live? I, Century Lane. My, my numbers were at 69 per trillion. Are you in the red, the black, or one of the other colors? Oh, my house was tested at 69. Okay, what I, what I would recommend again, the individual houses, there are people out there who have sheets that house by house know exactly your circumstance. I don't know which of the sections you're in by that address. Again, if you go out there and go by the maps, the large blow up maps like this, there are DES employees that got green name bags. I forgot mine in my office. Um, what, I, what I'm saying is Penichuk has already been to the house, said, yes, uh, well, we're all set to hook back Ma'am, I'm saying is none of us know the answer because we don't know which section you are in. Okay. Well, yeah. except you'll notice there's other colors mixed in the gray. There are some blacks, there are some pinks, there are some other colors. Okay, we're, we, we were connected 22 years ago. Yes, ma'am. I understand now, what I'm saying. Us, None of us know the circumstance of your home. Those people, all the individual packets are out there. I've already been told it's at my cost. It shouldn't be. Ma'am. Hi, Frank. My question is for Penichuk. Um, he was just answered a question regarding uh, their well sources and their ability to provide water. Uh, for people that decide to use their wells and not decommission them completely. If, you know, you stated one of the uh, places you acquire the water from is Dara Pond. At this 
this point, their pond is decreasing in the amount of water. It has dropped significantly. Um, how long do you think it's going to last before Dara Pond runs out? They're also, Hudson is also drawing off a Dara Pond, which I believe goes to you, not you personally, but the company. Um, no. so what is the outlook in the future for this? Again, we're, we're held as a regulated utility to making sure that we have adequate supply, ma'am. So the, the supply that is available from the two wells as well as from our interconnection meets base demand needs. And then when, when those needs get stressed, we have to evaluate other alternatives, which we do on a continuing basis. The, the system as it's designed right now and including this upgrade to the Darapon pumping station will be, meet those base needs. And then we're working on long-term uh, alternatives that will enhance that ability through other sources. I apologize, I have a list of questions. Um, I'll try to group them by person. Uh, for the town, one of the costs that I've seen, not personally, but I see and expect for the town is uh, disposal of like all these cardboard boxes and plastic bottles at the water delivery has uh, been incurring at, at our town's uh, waste disposal site. Is, is the sound or is the town going to be reimbursed for that cost of? Uh, uh, recycling those and the town receives money for cardboard. Cool. So, so my taxes go down? They, they are already figured into your taxes. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, the, uh, I'm not sure who answers this one. Uh, I'm, my property is uh, less than 70. We're in the phase two connection, so I'm, I'm expecting to stay on bottled water for uh, the, the near future, and as you know, it gets cold here. Um, at least twice now I've had water delivered, and the boxes are sitting out in the rain. Um, if that ends up happening in the winter, I'm going to end up with a brick of ice in my driveway until spring, uh, right in front of my garage door. Um, that's a problem to me. Uh, is there anything that the Monadnock or the, you guys can do to coordinate that? Or? Yeah, as I said, Andy Fulton, who's standing at the very back of the aisle in the green shirt with his hand up in the air and the beard, is the person in charge of the water distribution program. Okay. If you talk to him, he can go over those. We are going to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the president of Monadnock to go over concerns that have been raised by people, not just here, but also in Merrimack. Bedford they've been Ocean. helpful, it's just... They're, they're very good, but there are some concerns as we go into winter, those concerns become more significant. Absolutely. And then my, my last question or two questions was... Uh, There's other people waiting, sir, so if you can... One question and that's... Very good. Okay. Thank you. Sir? Uh, two questions, actually. They're very related and brief. There was reports uh, that the point of view systems that were in place in New York with the previous St. Cobain pollution issue were failing and were putting uh, much harmful chemicals into the system. I believe is actually also reported uh, by DES at a previous meeting. Uh, how is that going to impact, is that going to be a concern of these point of view systems as well? What maintenance and who's going to, I would assume St. Gobain's going to cover the cost of the maintenance, but what kind of maintenance is going to be involved with this? Right. So the point in New York is they did in some of the early, now they were point of entry systems, so they were larger systems. They did use a kind of carbon that did release arsenic. Uh, part of installing a system is you don't have people drink from it right away. You install some, you test them, you make sure they're working well, and then you tell people to use them. So they'll go through that whole program and Culligan, when they come in, will present that. They have done work in the state, so they know what the water here is like. The carbon at Pease is Culligan Carbon. That's actually a company, Culligan Carbon. Uh, so from that standpoint, they know what they're doing here. We have experience with them. The problem there was they had not really tested the water adequately and they got a surprise. They will be testing it here. It's part of the routine. Uh, the last is the maintenance question. Right now we're looking at a four month maintenance cycle. These systems, the experience we've had at Pease, they work very effectively. And so four months is probably 
if anything, overly protective. But considering some of the variations we've seen, some of the high levels in some of the houses, uh, we're going to set up an overly precaution, precautionary you. standard. All right, thank you. So, Clark, this, this question is for you. Um, Sir. Did, I just want to verify, you said that um, even if you were over the 70 limit, um, you could still keep your well open if you, if you so desired? You say you were at 90? You can. We highly recommend against it. And the other is, again, if we determine that your well is actually a public health risk, we can come in and you can be ordered by the town health officer and us to shut it down and decommission it, and it's at your expense then. And, and at what level would that be? Right now, the standard of the state is 70. So, so if you're above 70 and you're drawing water, you are running the risk that we will determine your well is a health hazard. And Even though I decide not to cap it, you, you could come in like a month later and say you have to well, cap it. Well, you say not cap it. Do you mean that you're going to use it for non-consumptive uses Correct. or you're going to drink it? No, I'm going to use it for non-consumptive. So it goes back to the other gentleman's question. That really has to do with what level it's at and what you're doing with it. If, if we see you've got to head it out, I'm exaggerating, of course, you would never do this, but you've got it out and highlighting for kids that they can come have a free drink, we're going to come in and shut down your well. So if it's a closed irrigation system? It, it, Less likely. It, okay. we're, we're not walking around. I mean, I've seen plenty of people watering their lawns in the last couple of months during the drought. Other than one gas station, I haven't mentioned it to anybody. Um, we're, we're not here to make your life miserable, but we are really concerned. This stuff is not good for you. And, and if you're spraying it around in areas in which it could get onto people and into other people's sources of water, we're really concerned about it. If you're up at 90, we really do recommend you decommission your well. Okay. Um, second question on the service lines um, coming in across the property. Does the homeowner have a choice of the route? Uh, saying there would be perhaps irrigation lines, underground propane lines that would have to be traversed. One of the reasons that we came out and met with the individual homeowners uh, was to actually derive those plans on a property by property basis. Were you around when they came and did that inspection yes. on your property? Yeah. And did you specify those those items at that time? Well, I told them approximately. Yeah. yeah. And my, my hope is they took all of that information into account and the plan was drawn up accordingly. If you would like to call into our customer service department and or speak to either Mark Fillion or John Bovera in the, in the lobby, they can actually go over that with you so you can make sure because those plans on a property by property basis were supplied to the contractors who are doing the service line installations. Okay. And the whole reason we came to those properties was to make sure that we picked the best route on individual properties relative to those lines. Uh, there were flags put out on the properties. Mm -hmm. Some properties have no flags, some they're further back off the road quite a bit than other properties. What, what exactly is going on? Well, again, you're, believe it or not, you're asking the wrong okay. guy. Right. Um, ask Mark Fillion or John Bovier. Uh, they'll, they'll have the answer like that for you. Okay. okay? Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, so as I said, we've got a hard stop at 8 o'clock. The people who are in line now, we're going to stop it right there. So you'll get to ask your question, but I just want to make sure nobody else will be taking questions from. Sir? My house is in the black, which means next year. Why do I have to sign the paperwork tonight? Why do you have to? I'm, I'm getting catch up. Why do I have to sign the paperwork tonight? We're just trying to collect the information on all the properties so that we have it there for two reasons. Number one, we can supply it to the contractors such that they can go fast. And who knows, I don't know where you are in the black. Maybe you're tangential to one of those red spots, and it might be that they might be able to... They already you. told me I'm next year. They, I'm sorry? They already told me I'm next year. They already told you you're next year? Well, but the other thing is, is we're actually collecting information on the well decommissioning at this time um, relative to being able to supply that information to DES and St. Cobain. So as they're going through that process, they can identify what those elections are because that's going to be a separate process that has actually started. So if we sign tonight, is there a possibility I can change my mind next year? You can always change your mind, sir. But understand, as Mr. Freise has said, you know, someone who doesn't connect to public water under St. Cobain's agreement here may be subject to costs Well, I want to on. see if the town is going to get our demand. Okay. Why should I pay for water when I didn't have to? Understood, sir. For something that isn't my problem. I understand. But it is now. I understand. Okay, I hope this makes sense. First of all, is there fluoride in your water? No, ma'am. No fluoride? Okay. Um, how 
this makes sense. Uh, I was just wondering, I know you're trying to encourage people to uh, disconnect their well, you know, especially the people that want to mow their lawns, um, water their lawns and their cars. Uh, did you ever think of like having double meters where the, the metered for the, say their home, their regular service would be on one meter and for the outdoor use would be second. I have an all electric home, so my heat is on a separate meter and it's at a lower cost than my regular usage. Did you ever think of that? And that might our, our tariff structure does not allow for a dual metering situation, ma'am. Okay. We've talked about that in the past, but it has not been an approved tariff structure for our company. I was just thinking people would be encouraged. Uh, under, understood. Under yep, so, understood. I'm assuming what she was referring to is a deduct meter. Is that what that last question was about? Well, it could be or a dual meter. So are you saying Penichuk at all does not install um, deduct meters? No, we, we, we do not in, in private residences in those businesses. We have those for the, you know, our, our distribution system. We have to do that for certain, certain distribution needs, but no, we do not. Yeah. I actually have three questions. One is, if I don't want to sign the paperwork tonight, is there a problem with uh, sending it in before the end of the week? Yes, ma'am, you can do that. Actually, they've got provisions out there for that. Okay. They would walk through uh, that process. If you're one of the people who's got a pressure reducing valve, you will have to take a form that has to be notarized in the signature, but uh, they'll have the paperwork for you. They'll have a pre-posted envelope for you to mail it to us. Okay. The other question is... Just one um, If you take that paper, if you do require a pressure reducing valve and you do have to get it notarized, you can get that done at Town Hall. Okay, no problem. Thank you. The uh, point of um, service systems, I've actually already gone ahead and had one installed. So would I be reimbursed or put on the list for the ongoing maintenance till the spring because I'm in phase one? You're in phase one? Yes. I, yeah. So there's not phase? If, you're not, if you don't get it installed, I thought, if I don't get it installed before the winter. Right. As, as far as it. any cost you have incurred, the as was raised, you have to personally go to St. Gobain and try and be made right. We, we, I don't have the statutory authority to try and make you whole. Uh, as far as getting on a maintenance program, if you're in phase one, you're going to be done before we can get you on a maintenance program. But if it snows next week and we're done for the winter, then I'd be offered the, that system. It, I'm just saying if the window closes and I'm not online, and I've already installed one. I don't want to be missed on a list for ongoing maintenance reimbursement or, you know, that type uh, of thing. We could try and work that as far as the going forward. Yep. What, I hate to almost say this, but they, what they may insist is that Culligan put the system in. They did. For me, they did. Okay. Then, then it may be somewhere they can put you on maintenance. They have their own legal liability and their own concerns. They trust Culligan. They know Culligan. They're using Culligan nationwide. If you had some other company system, they may ask you to switch. But if you're on the standard Culligan system, we may be able to do it. Let me give you my card since you're in that very unique circumstance. Okay. If the snow flies early, maybe we can do that. Okay. But your previous costs, uh, under statutory authority, I have no ability to do anything. I'm sorry. And then the last question is when the gentleman came out to look at my property to run the lines, he kind of gave me the impression of there'd be a lot of destruction on the way in. Is my property going to be restored at no cost to me? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Now, it, it, may, it, it won't be till the spring, okay? I will tell you that snow does a nice job of covering up all that disruption during the winter, and in the spring we come back, and our intention is to restore. In fact, our contractors, what we're asking them to do when they go out there is to take pictures before they start the work so they see what it is they're restoring back to. So how do I handle something like an irrigation system? My system's about to be winterized, and I'm assuming I'd have to bring my own contractor out to mark the lines at an expense to me. Were you there when they actually came out to survey your property? And did you talk about where your irrigation system was? I did. So they should have put that on the plans. Again, if you want to talk to one of my engineers out there, they can talk to you about that. He didn't pay attention to the heads or how the lines. He just knew I had an irrigation okay. system. Okay but nobody focused on, sure. I mean, clearly I have to bring a vendor out to Mark. Sure. Them. Would you speak to either Mark Fillion or John Bovier in the lobby Absolutely. and they can give you the guidance, okay? okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, that is the last question for the evening. There will be a group of us staying around if, uh, to try and answer questions if you need them. And we want to thank everyone for coming to the um, presentations. Have a good evening, folks.